Gert pulled open the screen door and went inside. It was a large, rectangular room. The collective glow from the recently lit lamps didn't reach the ceiling. Loitering around the perimeter of the room were a passel of Johnsons of both sexes, spanning at least three generations, from a bald-headed baby straddling his mother's hip to a withered, toothless old woman, who Gert recognized as the reigning matriarch. Gert muttered with scorn, To think I'm related to this bunch. We ain't so proud to claim you neither. This from the man holding the place of honor in the corner of the room, where he sprawled in an overstuffed chair. He held a coffee can propped on one knee. Looking at Gert, he raised it to his mouth and spat a string of tobacco juice into it. Hiram Johnson had inherited his position as head of the clan from his father, and for the last four decades had ruled the family with an iron fist. His face was as crinkled as a dry creek bed in August. He had a dingy gray beard that covered his chest to the third button of his flannel shirt. A jar of moonshine and a fly swatter sat on the windowsill within easy reach of him. His bare right foot, missing toes and striated white with petrifaction, was propped on a footstool. A large, leather-bound Bible lay open in his lap. But I don't hail from the inbred branch of the family, Gert said. Eyeing her with malevolence, Hiram spat into the can again and wiped stained spittle from his beard with the back of his hand. Getting raided is bad for business, cousin. Couldn't tell it by the crowd we got tonight, Gert said. The place was hopping when I left. You had some products dashed? Enough for tonight, but the raid made a dent. I come to buy. Up. Hiram raised his index finger to one of his offspring, whose chair was propped against the wall, front legs raised. He was stropping a hunting knife. At the signal from the old man, the chair legs hit the floor. The man, addressed as Tup, came to his feet and slid the knife into a scabbard at his waist. Load her up, Hiram said to him. He was on his way to the door when Gert said, Ten gallons less than what we usually take. Tup looked to Hiram for direction. Gert kept her expression blank. Never taking his eyes off her, Hiram said, You heard her. Tup pushed open the screen door and went out, calling to someone unseen to come help him. How come you're cutting back? Hiram asked. Gert took a slow look around the room, as though taking inventory of the assembled relatives. They all appeared indolent and uninterested, but she knew better. They all had the trademark big ears, but not necessarily in the physical sense. Hiram, grasping that she wanted to talk to him privately, flipped his hand at the room at large. Get. His offspring began to scatter, some going outside, others disappearing into other rooms. A teenaged girl helped the old woman out of her chair and supported her as she hobbled out. Watching her leave, Gert said, I thought she'd have died by now. You too. And why don't you spare us all that stink and cut that damn foot off? Ignoring that, Hiram repeated his question about her order. Gert seated herself in one of the vacated chairs. While your boys have been keeping the roads hot between your stills and the oil patches, small-timers have been taking up the slack locally. You're losing ground, Hiram. You're being undercut. Nobody would dare. Fine, don't believe me, but Lefty struck a deal today. I sitting right there when they shook on it. More hooch for a lot cheaper than you charge us. Right good. Nope, good stuff. Label liquor? Gert shook her head. Shine. Whose? I'll get to that. Let's talk about Wally. He slapped his palm onto the open Bible in his lap. God is my witness. Which he ain't. We're gonna get the bitch what killed Wally. Gert crossed her arms over her massive chest. You made any headway in that direction? We'll get him. That means you got no idea who done it. Temper sparked. Hiram leaned forward, nearly tipping over his spit can. If you know something, you'd better tell me. Or being my second cousin thrice removed won't mean shit. 
Kinship won't save your fat ass from being flayed. She huffed an exhale. The night before Wally was murdered, he tore into one of my girls. No doubt Hiram had heard about it because he didn't dispute or defend it. She weren't much count as a whore, but she was handy helping Lefty on the grill and serving drinks in the back room, so I kept her on. You're saying was. She die after all? No, the ungrateful hussy ran off last night, still owing me money for her upkeep. Slipped off during the raid. Today I learned she's been took in. By who? By the moonshiner who persuaded Lefty to squeeze you out of ten jugs per order. She leaned forward and tapped her temple. I put two and two together. One bullet was fired into Wally's head for stealing that truckload of sugar and causing a shortage. The second bullet was payback for whipping up on that whore. Hiram picked up the Bible and brandished it. He's dead meat. Gert's smiles were as infrequent as blood moons. She gave Hiram Johnson a smug one now. Ain't no he. 39. Irv scowled up at Laurel from his pillow. Hutton dropped that on you, then just left? Without another word. Now part of their morning routine, she tied a knot to secure the fresh bandage around his chest. There. Does it have to be so tight? Yes, because you work it loose as the day goes on. But the wound looks better today than yesterday. And it will continue to get better if you rest. I've done nothing besides lie in bed. And fret. Your mind needs rest too. Stop worrying so much. First you tell me that Ernie's secret stash has been stolen. Then that you took it upon yourself to go alone to Lefty's. And lastly, about this doomsday message from Hutton. Now you tell me to stop worrying? Do you know Chester Landry? How would I know a guy who sells lady shoes? Maybe more than shoes. What's he look like? She described him to the best of her recollection. I only saw him that one time in the cafe, and I wasn't really paying attention. She'd been distracted by Thatcher. Irv scratched his bristly chin. I know the fella you're talking about. I've seen him in town. Where? Here and there. At Lefty's? No, and I think I would remember considering those duds he wears. If you haven't seen him there, then it's possible Mr. Hutton's hunch about him is wrong. Just as possible that he's right, though, Laurel. Remember I told you it was rumored that a bootlegger from Dallas was a big-time operator around here? Could be Landry's him. Hutton must think so, or he wouldn't have gone out of his way to tell you. That wasn't all he came to tell me. You'll be glad to know that Sheriff Amos is letting you off the hook this time, in the hope that you've learned your lesson. And I hope you've learned yours. He shook his finger at her. Out at Lefty's, you're in danger of more than bootleggers. Don't go there again. I won't. When he looked sternly doubtful, she stressed that she wouldn't. I only went to seal your deal. The O'Connors will be making the deliveries. Larger deliveries. Which is what we were going for, Irv, remember? There's nothing the matter with my memory, but our gain represents a loss to competitors. I'm all for increasing our business, but not if it means that one or all of us will meet with bodily harm. I'll be doubly discreet and careful. Warn those twins not to be so damn cocky, but don't tell them why. Keep it general. You still don't trust them. Never have trusted men with dimples. She laughed. What do you have against dimples? He went on as though she hadn't interrupted. Ernie and Korean need to be put on watch, too. Because of the theft, Ernie is already on alert. How'd Ernie take to Korean? She hedged. She'll grow on him. He barked a laugh. Don't count on it. He's used to his own company in silence. God knows he'll have precious little of that. Laurel smiled. I have pies to bake today, but I'll drive out and check on them tomorrow. Hopefully they'll have several crates of whiskey ready for me. Speaking of, I could do with a nip. 
at bedtime. I just woke up at bedtime. I'm hurting now. Part of the healing process. She stood up and straightened the cover where she'd been sitting at the foot of his bed. He was idly scratching his chin again. Your stubble is itching. Would you like a shave? No. I'm happy to do it. He waved off the offer. I'm thinking is all. Something's gnawing at you, Irv. What? You say you introduce Hutton to the twins? How'd that go? All right. After they shook hands, I sent the twins on their way. In giving Irv an account of last night's visit from Thatcher, she had omitted certain details, one being the hostility that had crackled between him and the O'Connors. She also didn't tell him that Thatcher had questioned her about the deliveries the twins made to Ranger, or that Sheriff Amos had pointed the O'Connors out to Thatcher while referring to them as wild. Nor did she mention that Thatcher had asked who supplied Irv's moonshine. Unabridged honesty could set his recovery back for weeks, which was how she justified those omissions. Even so, his forehead remained furrowed. This warning from Hutton about Chester Landry worries me, he said. It should worry you too, Laurel. My advice is to steer clear of the man. I plan to, whether or not he's into bootlegging. Irv peered up at her through his lowered brows. I wasn't referring to Landry. Bernie Croft had eaten a late breakfast at Martin's Cafe. Rather than ride to his office, he'd chosen to walk the short distance and was almost there when a deranged individual lunged at him from out of a narrow alleyway. He was grabbed roughly by the lapel of his suit coat, jerked into the space between the two buildings, and forcefully pushed against a brick wall. Hands closed around his neck and began to choke him. Dr. Gabe Driscoll was barely recognizable. His eyes were bloodshot, his bared and clenched teeth looked feral, but his fingers were like steel clamps around Bernie's throat. I'm going to kill you! Bernie gasped. Jesus Christ, Gabe! He planted his hands on the physician's chest and pushed with all his might. Obviously in a weakened state, Gabe wasn't that hard to dislodge. He reeled backward and landed against the opposite brick wall, his shoulder catching the brunt of the impact. He clapped his hand over his rotator cuff and yelped in pain. Hennessy came bounding in from the end of the alley. Bernie held up a hand. The bodyguards skidded to a halt. I'm all right, Bernie said, but don't let anybody wander in here. Hennessy looked at Driscoll with misgiving. Bernie patted the air. It's fine, Jimmy. Hennessy backed out of the alley and posted himself at the entrance to it. Bernie returned his attention to Gabe, whose ferocity had evaporated. He was slumped against the wall. What in hell is wrong with you? Bernie hissed. It's 10.30 in the morning, and you're pissing drunk. Why did you tell? Tell what? Gabe glared at him with maddened eyes. You want me to yell it out loud? You want me to shout it out so everybody will know about Pointer's Gap? Unmindful of Hennessy, he stumbled toward the street. Bernie reached out, clutched a handful of his jacket, and yanked him back. Despite his rancid body odor and days old breath, Bernie held him by the lapels and got right in his face, speaking softly but with emphasis. Nobody knows. You promised me that no one would, but you told Norma Blanchard. Why? Why? Bernie instantly released him and took a step back. He felt like his head might explode. Every blood vessel in his body began to throb with wrath. But he clenched his teeth in order to keep his features rigid and his expression impassive. He tugged on the hem of his vest, shot his cuffs, assumed his customary, intimidating, confident posture, and said blandly, Insurance? Gabe blinked several times. How did you even know about her and my... our... Your grubby, adulterous affair? I make it my business to know who's fucking whom. It comes in handy on occasions just such as this, Dr. Driscoll. I've got you by the balls, you see. 
You killed your wife in order to take up with your mistress and bastard child. Gabe flinched and gulped back a sob. I came to you that night for help. You came to me panicked, beyond any hope of getting yourself out of a nasty fix without my assistance. You were out of your mind with desperation and fear, and I responded immediately. We made a vow. Yes, we did. We made a vow to help each other, quid pro quo. I held up my end of our bargain in a matter of hours. You, by contrast, he sniffed with disdain. Look at you. You're a wreck, a disgrace. Gabe wiped his dripping nose with the back of his hand. You swore to me that no one would ever know. But did you think that a man in my position would volunteer to get rid of your problem without holding some collateral? Did you think that, Gabe? Did you really? Are you that naive, that dim? The man's shoulders sagged. His head dropped forward as though the pin of a hinge holding it onto his neck had been pulled. Bernie let him suffer in humiliation and silence for several moments, then said, I assume Miss Blanchard is using this information for leverage of her own? She's come to the house twice, Gabe mumbled. Once in the middle of the night. I lectured her on how foolhardy that was, but she came back. In daytime, no less. She even brought the baby. She wants us to be together. Bernie made a sound of regret and sighed. Typical female behavior. She's wanting to nest. It's too soon. People would become suspicious. Rightfully, Bernie said. You must drill that home to Miss Blanchard. Or would you rather I speak with her on your behalf? Gabe raised his head and looked at Bernie with bleary eyes. No, I'll do it. Bernie gave Gabe's arm a fatherly squeeze of support. I suggest that before you go calling on your lady love, you get sober, take a bath and shave, get a haircut, buy Miss Blanchard something nice, take the baby a play pretty. Gabe nodded assent, but Bernie could tell that his heart wasn't in it. With vexation, he said, I gave you two weeks to sort yourself out, Gabe. Instead, you've lost ground, and your time is up. You start tomorrow. What? Hang out your shingle. Resume making house calls. Dispense pills. Set broken bones. Administer enemas. And as agreed, begin your work for me. Smuggling bootleg liquor on my rounds. Bernie tugged on his lower lip. Actually, since our last conversation, I've determined that any able-bodied person with half a brain can do that. I have plenty of them already on my payroll. You would be a wasted asset doing manual labor. No, what I have in mind for you now, Gabe, is something more complex, more suited to an austere and respected man who has the knowledge of science and the healing arts. Befuddled, Gabe said, what are you talking about, Bernie? Poison. 40. Thatcher was working late. The sun had already set, making it dark enough in the stable to require a lantern. He moved it from stall to stall as he replenished water and feed for each of his charges. The mare who had caused him to work overtime snuffled and tossed her head when he entered her stall. She had a bad reputation for kicking, so he waited for her to settle before closing himself in with her. I saved you for last because we need to have a talk. He moved to stand where she could see him. He stroked her forehead. You kick another board out of Mr. Barker's fence, he may kick both of us off his property. I'd lose money. Your owner, who's already put out with you, would send you to the glue factory. Her ears twitched. She was listening. What he would rather do is breed you with that handsome stallion he's got. If you keep acting unladylike, you'll miss out. He's hung like a racehorse, he whispered. He is a racehorse. The other mares would give their eye teeth. Think it over. He lifted a coiled lasso from a hook and began rubbing it over her with one hand while smoothing her coat with the other. Dryly, he said, 
Of course, I'm nobody to be giving advice in that department. He'd spent three restless nights since he'd gone to Laurel's house and had seen her with the O'Connor brothers. She thought they were charming. They had the gift of gab. They made her laugh. This was Thatcher's first experience with jealousy, but it had sunk its claws in deep. He understood now how it could cloud a man's judgment and cause him to behave irrationally. But jealousy aside, he didn't see anything good coming from Laurel Plummer mixing with Hellraisers the likes of them. Thatcher knew, damn his knack for reading people, that she didn't always tell him the whole truth. Some of that wiggling around certain topics and giving less than direct answers could be passed off as part of her prideful nature. She was fiercely determined to stand on her own. But he suspected that her sidestepping pertained to something besides protecting her privacy. And that bothered him, because he didn't think she had taken his warning about Chester Landry seriously. To get her to listen, to try and impress upon her how important it was that she heed his warning, he had held her and made out like he was going to kiss her again. The instant he'd put his hands on her, he'd gotten her attention all right, but she'd for damn sure gotten his too. He'd counted on feeling a stiff corset, or whatever it was women wore under their clothes, to narrow this and plump that, but all he'd felt through Laurel's dress was Laurel. Her waist had been giving, each dainty rib delineated. The heel of his hand had brushed the underside of her breast. Not to cup that soft crescent in his palm, he deserved some kind of medal. He... The mare's ears twitched, and she restlessly bobbed her head at the exact moment that Thatcher heard a noise coming from the front of the stable. He lowered the lariat, but continued to run his hand over the mare's withers to keep her calm. A rustle, the faint crunch of straw underfoot. Maybe some kind of critter? Mouse, rat, cat, possum? Then a clangor that would raise the dead. An animal might knock over an empty feed bucket, but it wouldn't cuss a blue streak when it did. The mare began to stamp and neigh, as did the other horses in their stalls. Thatcher hooked the lariat over his shoulder, unlatched the stall door, and slipped through. But he had to take the time to latch it back so the mare wouldn't get out. Once it was secure, he ran to the wide stable door. As he cleared the opening, he caught sight of a fleeing male figure. Thatcher bolted after him. It was full-on dusk, but Thatcher spotted the intruder skirting around the corral and running for the creek. Thatcher went after him, uncoiling the lariat as he ran. As the man began to slide down the steep embankment, Thatcher tossed the rope and lassoed him with ease, neatly dropping the loop over his head and trunk, pinning his arms against his torso. The man gave a sharp cry as he was jerked backward and off his feet. When he landed butt first on the rocky ground, he let fly another round of colorful profanities. Thatcher walked toward him, taking up the slack in the rope as he went. The face that glared up at him was that of a young man still in his teens, about Roger's age. Fuck you, cowboy! Thatcher planted the sole of his boot against the youngster's chest and pushed him onto his back, holding him down with his foot. You know what happens to horse thieves? Still glaring, the boy remained stubbornly silent. They're hanged from the nearest tree. The young man's rebellious, hostile expression wavered. What I said, I didn't mean nothing by it. Sounded to me like you did. The kid peered up through the gathering darkness into Thatcher's face. Heard about some cowboy who shot the head off a rattlesnake here in town. You him? Uh-huh. Oh, shit. Roger tell you? Don't know no Roger. Just picked up word of it somewhere. Thatcher tipped his head back toward the stable. Horse thieves are a sorry lot. I was just looking around is all. Bald-faced liars are just as bad. Thatcher removed his foot and hauled the kid up. Before you kicked over that bucket and gave yourself away, you figured on helping yourself to a horse, didn't you? I kicked over that goddamn bucket on my way out. I changed my mind about borrowing a horse. You saw my lantern. Saw the horses. I thought they'd be saddled. 
In spite of himself, Thatcher chuckled. A sorry, thieving numbskull. What's your name? Thatcher's insult said put the chip back on his shoulder. What's it to you, Billy the Kid? Thatcher looked around, his gaze landing on a large live oak. That lowest branch ought to do. He started toward it, yanking on the rope, pulling the kid along behind. He dug his heels in. Wait, wait, hold it. It's El Ray. My name is El Ray Johnson. Recognizing the name immediately, Thatcher stopped and turned back. The sheriff had told Thatcher about El Ray Johnson's fearfulness following the murder of his cousin, Wally. El Ray looked ready to jump out of his skin now. Why were you trying to steal a horse, El Ray? With no cockiness left in him, the kid choked up and gave a hard shake of his head. You can hang me, mister, but I ain't telling. Bill was summoned from home by Scotty. The deputy didn't share much information over the telephone, except to say that the matter had to do with El Ray Johnson. That didn't bode well. When Bill walked into the department ten minutes later, he wasn't met with the chaos he'd expected. The wall clock's pendulum ticked loudly in the otherwise quiet room. Scotty was filing paperwork. He said, Sorry to bring you from home. What's the trouble? Where's El Ray? He's got him back there in a cell. Who does? Your boy wonder. Bill rebuked that remark with a stern look. I assume you're referring to Thatcher. Are the rest of us supposed to consider him official? Good question, Bill muttered as he hung up his hat. He entered the cell block where all the barred doors stood open. In the first cell, Thatcher was leaning with his back to the wall, one foot flat against it, his knee raised. He had a bead on El Ray, who was sitting on the cot, gnawing at his fingernails and jiggling his knees. When he saw Bill, he shot to his feet and aimed an accusing finger at Thatcher. He roped me like a damn calf! He was gonna hang me! Bill looked at Thatcher, who said, He sneaked into Barker's stable to steal a horse. He bungled it and I caught him, but that's not why I put him in here. Okay, Bill said. I'm listening. He said he would rather me hang him than tell me why he needed a horse. Bill hadn't seen Thatcher since the morning he'd come to the house. During their conversation on the porch, he'd told Thatcher more than was comfortable about his and Daisy's personal life, but he knew instinctually that his secrets were safe with this man of few words. He also knew that Thatcher wouldn't have hanged the Johnson kid, but had scared him into thinking he would. Apparently, Thatcher also had perceived that El Ray's desperation might signify a need to flee. Bill thought Thatcher was probably right. El Ray had dropped back down onto the cot. His knees were bobbing again at a frantic rate. Bill asked, What's going on? Nothing. Did you intend to steal a horse? No. Nah. Thatcher said, He admitted he was until he realized they didn't come already saddled. Wanting to laugh, Bill managed a strict tone. That true, El Ray? Glowering at Thatcher, he said sullenly, He didn't have to rope me and jerk me to the ground. It's a miracle my butt bone ain't broke. I'd have stopped running if he'd have asked me nice. Bill said, Where were you planning to go on horseback? Just riding. I hadn't thought that far ahead. Bill went over to the cot motioned for El Ray to scoot to the other end of it and sat down where the boy had been. My supper's getting cold on your account, and you dare to bullshit me? Now where were you off to that was so important you'd steal a horse to get there? El Ray's face muscles began working like a child's on the brink of tears. Somewhere. Anywhere to lay low for a while. Why do you need to lay low? He choked on a sob. If they find out I was here, talking to y'all, they'll... they'll... No telling what they'll do to me. Oh. Can't say. Your family? El Ray wiped his dripping nose on his sleeve. Goddamn Wally. What about him? He was always stirring up trouble, then skipping out. Leaving it to everybody else to clean up his mess. Is that what's happening now? A clean up? El Ray didn't answer. Bill said, 
Has something come to light about who killed Wally? Elray's eyes darted between Bill and Thatcher, then he lowered his head and shook it no. Then why were you hoping to get away? Just tired of everybody being all worked up over it is all. He sat up straighter, gave a belligerent roll of his shoulders, and looked across at Thatcher before coming back to Bill. He don't know what I wasn't at the stable only to take a gander at the guy who shot that rattler. I weren't in there more than a few seconds and didn't steal shit. Anyhow, I got nothing more to say. Bill looked over at Thatcher, who raised a shoulder and said, He's not worth the trouble it would take to hang him. I doubt Mr. Barker would want to bother with pressing charges of trespassing. Then what do you suggest? He gave another laconic shrug. Notify his kin to come take him off your hands. Bill recognized it as a bluff, but Elray didn't. He surged to his feet again. No! Bill grabbed him by the waistband of his breeches and jerked him back down onto the cot. What's got you scared, son? You tell me or I'll hand deliver you to your great granddaddy. What's Hiram up to? Vengeance for Wally? Elray hiccuped several times, then said, He's been on a rampage. He ordered all us to comb the hills, every square inch we could cover. Any stills we found, tear them up, he said. Wreak havoc on anybody making moonshine who ain't a Johnson, is how he put it. He made another swipe at his nose. The other night, one of my cousins, we call him Tup, don't ask why, me and him were exploring and picked up the scent of wood smoke. We followed it to a still, two actually, but only one man was camped out there. What had drawn us was the smoke from his cook fire. We weren't doing a run, just tinkering around. We watched him hide a crate of shine in a hole in the ground. After he went into his tent, we waited to make sure he was down for the night, then snuck up to the hiding place and took his whiskey. How much? Bill asked. Ten crates. Ten crates? It was a deep hole, like a grave, only covered up good with brush. Had to make several trips to get it all back to our truck. Did you know the man? Don't think so but it was dark, so I couldn't see him good. Do you think he saw you? I know he didn't. He had firepower within reach. If he'd have seen us, he would have used it. We got away clean. Stroking his mustache, Bill mulled that over. Sounds to me like Hiram ought to be happy with you and your cousin. When El Ray didn't respond, Bill asked, Or isn't that the end of the story? Thatcher hadn't moved or taken his eyes off the boy. He said, I don't think it is, Sheriff. He's spooked. Is he right, Elray? Bill asked. Things is getting crazy, he said, his voice cracking. This path of vengeance Hiram is on? Elray nodded several times. Old Hiram, he ain't my great granddaddy, he's my great uncle. He told Tup and me that those two stills we happened on sounded like easy pickings. The shine we stole was quality, too. He wouldn't like that, Bill said. Competition. Yes, sir. He told us to go back, steal all the liquor that was bottled, dump out the barrels of ferment and mash, bust up the stills, and... He lowered his voice. And hurt whoever was there. Make them sorry they'd ever heard the name of Johnson, he said. Wreak havoc. Yes, sir. You jumped to carry out his orders to hurt people? I weren't given no choice, Sheriff. And Tup, who has a mean streak a mile wide, was looking forward to it. So we went back last night. Who'd you hurt and how bad? Did you kill the moonshiner? No. Tup and me waited till late and snuck up, same as before. Nobody was around. The cookers weren't thumping and the cook fire had burned down to coals. We crept over to where the hole's at. Tup reached into the brush covering it and... He stopped and swallowed several times. I ain't ever heard a scream like that, not from nobody, not even from a woman. What happened to him? Bear trap. Damn near chomped his arm in two. Then the shooting started. How many shooters? I didn't stick around to count. I ran like hell. His voice cracked again. I got to our truck and took off, but after a few miles, I left it and struck off on foot. Afraid you'd be followed by the man at the still? Thatcher asked. He shook his head. He already had Tup. 
He might have shown me mercy if I'd have given his whiskey back. But I knew that Uncle Hiram, all them, was going to be wondering why me and Tup hadn't come back. I ran out on him. And that's something a that Johnson won't forgive, running out on Ken. If they find me, they'll kill me, slow and in misery. Bill feared the boy was right. He and Thatcher exchanged a glance, and Bill could tell that he was of the same mind. El Ray's head was down. He was staring at the loose cuticle that he'd picked at until it had bled. I've been hiding all day, working my way into town, waiting for it to get dark. I counted on hopping a freight, but missed the last one out till tomorrow morning. He raised his head and looked at Thatcher. I was going to steal a horse so I could get the hell away from here. Bill asked, Do you think your cousin is dead? Don't know. The shooting stopped, but his screaming didn't. I could hear him all the way back to the truck. He might have died or been killed after I left. He thought on it for a moment, then added, Like I said, he's got a cruel temper, especially when he's drunk, which is usually. But I'm a damn coward for leaving him. That's what Hiram will say, and what that old bastard says is law. Not in this office, it isn't. Bill stood up. You sit tight while I call in some deputies. Then we'll be on our way. El Ray sniffed back dripping snot and looked at him dumbly. On our way where? You have to guide us to those stills, El Ray. His eyes went wide and wild. Please don't make me. Anyhow, I'd lose my way. I don't remember where they're at. Ignoring that, Bill tipped his head toward the door into the main room and started moving in that direction. Thatcher? Thatcher pushed himself upright. Hold on a sec. As he walked toward El Rey, the boy shrunk back against the wall behind the cot. Frantic, he looked over at Bill. Don't leave me by myself with him! Thatcher stood over him. Relax, El Rey. If I'd have wanted to hurt you, I would have strung you up. Then what you want? I want to know what you're lying about. I ain't. I owned up to stealing that whiskey, leaving Tup and... Not all that. Then what? What's come to light about who killed Wally? 41. Laurel turned off the highway and started up the familiar, rutted drive to the shack, where she was dropping off supplies for Corinne, before driving the remainder of the way to the stills to pick up product. It didn't surprise her that the dwelling was barely detectable in the darkness. Corinne spent most of the nighttime hours working with Ernie at the still, rarely returning until daylight. But on the night she was in the shack, it still looked unoccupied from the road. Not wishing anyone to know that it was inhabited, Laurel had purchased a bolt of thick black cloth from the general store in another town. Corinne and she had draped the shack's few windows with it and tacked it over the interior walls to keep light from leaking through the cracks. Corinne used the cook stove as infrequently as possible to keep smoke at a minimum. When the season changed and the pot-bellied stove was needed for heat, they would have to make adjustments, but Laurel had a few months to figure it out. She pulled her car around to the rear of the building, out of sight of the road, and retrieved her parcels from the floorboard. It was a moonless night, but she knew where there were obstacles to avoid as she made her way. One of them was the chicken coop, which reminded her of that malicious rooster. Before moving into town, she had made good on her threat to throw him into a stew pot, Ernie's. She'd given the laying hens to an old folks' home, the staff of which had been most grateful for the contribution. Thinking of the rooster reminded her of the altercation she'd had with him the day she'd met Thatcher. And the reminder of Thatcher made her truculent. That was the word Irv had used to describe her mood since their last encounter. She'd neither seen nor heard anything further about Chester Landry, either to substantiate or dispel Thatcher's warning. When she'd asked the twins if his name was familiar to them, they'd told her they'd heard of the shoe salesman through their friend Randy. But Randy hadn't been around lately, and they'd never met his pal Chester. The twins had begun delivering to lefties, so far without incident. Although, they'd told Laurel, since the raid, the sheriff's department had begun patrolling the roads around the roadhouse with regularity. 
Lefty had complained about the increased vigilance keeping customers away. Since that night in the yard, Thatcher hadn't sought her out. She considered the matter closed. Out of politeness, she tapped on the door to the shack and softly called Corinne's name. Getting no response, she pulled open the door and went inside. As expected, Corinne wasn't there. Laurel set the parcels she'd brought on the table, leaving it to Corinne to put away the items where she wanted them. On her way out, Laurel noticed two things about Irv's old bureau. To support the legless corner, Corinne had replaced the stacked catalogs with blocks of wood. And on top, along with her hairbrush and other personal articles, was the primer Laurel had given her. She thumbed open the cover and was pleased to see that Corinne had been practicing. She'd copied several lines of the alphabet on the first page. The letters were imperfect, but by page three she was showing improvement. On page four, she doodled a drawing. Beneath it, she'd printed Ernie. Laurel laughed softly. Maybe Corinne's drawing was an indecipherable death threat. Their relationship was still prickly. She returned the primer to its place on the bureau, then stepped out and pulled the door closed. As she was retracing her way to the back, she heard the sound of an approaching automobile on the road. A set of headlights topped a hill. Another set of lights followed close behind the first, then a third vehicle. All were traveling fast, maintaining their distance from each other, looking very much like a convoy with a mission. Laurel's heart lurched and didn't stop pounding until they had passed the turnoff to the shack. She could easily have talked her way around being here. It was still Irv's property. She could say she had come to retrieve something he had left behind when they'd moved. But then, a worse thought occurred to her. If the shack hadn't been their destination, where were they going in such an obvious hurry? Beyond here was no man's land. Nothing out there except... Not thinking twice about it, she began running toward the hill behind the shack. She forgot all the safety precautions she had hammered into Corinne. Her pistol was in her pocket, but she didn't have a lantern, and she wouldn't have lit it if she did. She didn't tread carefully. She didn't think about turning her ankle or slipping on loose rocks and plunging down a steep incline into a crevice where she could die of thirst before being found. She heard the yap of a coyote, but it was far away, and the only predator that concerned her was man, lawmen, or angry competitors. She didn't know which posed the greatest threat, and was loath to speculate on the consequences of the stills being discovered by either element. If indeed that's where the convoy was headed, she had to get there first. The stills might have to be abandoned, but Corinne and Ernie could escape. Over the months that she'd been making this trek, she'd found routes that weren't so steep, that curved up the incline gradually. But they meandered and took more time, and she was aware of time running out. She went straight up. She stumbled once and fell to her knee. Her skirt and petticoat helped to pad her kneecap, but she'd struck it hard enough to jar her teeth. She would bear a bruise. Losing her footing a second time, she reached for a bush to break her fall. The brittle foliage scraped her arm. A nightbird swooped low directly in front of her, its screech causing her to cry out in fright despite the need for stealth. Her lungs began to burn, her heart felt near to bursting, but she pushed on, upward. If she was wrong, they would all have a good laugh over her frantic climb later, much later. But for now, she must assume that her friends were in danger of being caught, captured, punished to the extreme. If she arrived too late, they might even pay with their lives. Even in the darkness, she knew she was approaching the crest that overlooked Ernie's camp. She was panting hard as she scrambled up the last several yards. Sweat dripped into her eyes, causing them to sting. As she topped the hill, she closed her eyes to blink away the sweat, but also to postpone, even for a millisecond, what she would see below. Praying for the best, expecting the worst, she opened her eyes. What she saw caused her to stagger backward. She gasped for breath through her mouth, which hung open in disbelief. 
because there was nothing to see below. The clearing was empty. 42. The sheriff stood at the edge of the clearing with his hands on his hips in a pose of disgust. He watched while deputies used flashlights to search the area, which obviously had been recently vacated. God damn it. Thatcher came alongside him in time to overhear his muttered blasphemy. They just left with Tup. His given name is Thomas. How's he doing? Hanging on. Doc Perkins gave him a shot of morphine, but up to that point he was vocal, very. Cursed the sons of bitches who had laid the trap, cussed his sorry-assed cousin who'd abandoned him. Thatcher paused, then added, Honestly, when we arrived and there was nothing here, I thought El Ray had been lying about all of it, even the stills. El Ray's memory of the stills' location had been miraculously restored when Bill again threatened to turn him over to his great-uncle Hiram. Shortly thereafter, three sheriff's department vehicles, one with Dr. Perkins as a ride-along, had set out from town with El Ray giving directions. Because the night was so dark, he'd mistaken landmarks several times, and they'd had to double back in order to find turnoffs previously missed. The various roads they traveled became progressively narrow and rutted, winding through hills that all looked the same to Thatcher. He had begun to suspect El Rey of leading them on a wild goose chase, when the kid had suddenly sat forward and pointed through the windshield. Over there, behind them cedars. Tup Johnson had been found in the grave-like hole that El Rey had described. He was still alive, but if he didn't die of gangrene or sepsis, he would surely lose the limb, which was half-severed already, grotesquely dark and swollen, and had jagged, broken bones protruding from it. As Bill and his deputies had fanned out to investigate the scene, he asked Thatcher to remain with Tup and try to get from him as much information as he could. Apparently, it had slipped the sheriff's mind that Thatcher had declined to become a deputy. But none of this would be taking place if he had let El Rey go. So, having only himself to blame for his involvement, he'd done as Bill requested. No, El Rey wasn't lying, Thatcher, Bill said now. There were stills here, all right, too, just like the kid claimed. You ever seen one before? Only pictures. Those stacks of rocks are the fireboxes. Some of the charred wood is still smoldering. Cookers sat on top? Right. Scotty figured the flues were backed up to the cliff face there, an old trick to disperse the smoke, keep it from being easily spotted. What about the man El Ray and Tup saw working here? Not a trace. All we know for sure was that he wasn't a Johnson. He had a partner, Thatcher said, bringing Bill around to him. Yeah, Tup says there were two of them, but he never got a glimpse of either. While he was writhing on the ground, they came up behind him and put a burlap sack over his head. He thought for sure they would put a bullet through it, but one held his good arm while the other released the trap. No sign of it, Bill said. Retrieved to use another day, no doubt. They lowered Tup into the pit. None too gently, he said, but they left him with a canteen of water and a full jar of moonshine. He admits that he yelled and screamed and cried for his mama. They ignored him and went about breaking camp. He managed to uncap the jar with one hand, drank all the whiskey, and eventually passed out. This morning, when he came to, he knew they were gone. Dead silence, he said, except for the gurgling of the spring. Moonshiners capable of assembling a still or just as capable of rapidly taking it apart and relocating. Thatcher smiled. Not to a spot as good as this one. According to Tup, this is an ideal place. He would know. Together, they watched deputies pick through a clump of dead brush to see what it might yield, but nobody cried Eureka. Bill said, Tup didn't see them, but what about their voices? Never spoke a word, neither of them. All night? That's what he said. Huh. Moonshiners clever enough to keep their mouths shut. I guess. Anything else he remembers? Thatcher rubbed the back of his neck. They were light-footed. He got another questioning look from the sheriff. 
I don't know what to make of that either, but Tup said they both had a light tread. So our suspects are clever, mute Lightfoots, Bill sighed. At least we know El Ray was telling the truth about this. You still think he's lying? About something. How sure are you? Royal flush sure. Bill gave a grunt. Thatcher watched the flickering flashlight beams sweeping across the ground. The clearing has been pretty much covered. Has anybody checked for tracks leading away from it? A couple of the men tried but got nowhere. Are you any good at tracking? Stray cows, wolves, coyotes, bobcats. Bill handed him a flashlight. You're not looking for scatter paw prints. Don't venture too far in the dark. I don't want to have to search for you too. I need to get home. How's Mrs. Amos? Bill turned away. Meet me back at the car in 10. Thatcher rejoined him in under 10 minutes and returned his flashlight. Too dark to see much. I'll send a team out after daylight, but I have a feeling our bear trappers are too savvy to leave an easily followed trail. El Ray had been so fearful of Tup's wrath, he'd pleaded with them to let him stay in the car to avoid being seen. He'd been hunched down in the back seat under a deputy's guard. Bill dismissed the deputy, then got into the driver's seat. Y'all find anything? El Ray asked. I mean, except for Tup. Bill didn't answer. Neither did Thatcher as he climbed into the back with El Ray. I'm not ignorant enough to jump out of a moving car, Mr. Hutton. You don't have to ride back here with me. At some point over the course of the night, the kid had begun addressing Thatcher respectfully, which amused Thatcher. He didn't think El Ray was a genuinely bad sort or ignorant, but more hapless than anything, like he'd had the rotten luck to be born into a family where he didn't truly fit, which was probably why he was coming to like the kid. But now, he followed Sheriff Amos's lead and gave El Ray the silent treatment as he settled in beside him. He didn't feel like talking just now anyway. Their silence must have been unnerving because El Ray began to chatter. Only law I broke was to steal another moonshiner's whiskey, and how can that be a crime? I won't see a nickel from that. Plus, I was acting under orders to cause pain, but I didn't raise a hand to nobody. When neither Thatcher nor the sheriff responded, he continued. Them stills was hit so good, weren't for me, y'all never would have found them. Y'all should be thanking me, not... He swallowed. Not whatever y'all are planning. What I think is, what y'all ought to do is keep me locked up in jail. Maybe a jail in a faraway town. Just till the dust settles around here. Better yet, put me on that freight train tomorrow morning, and you'll never have any trouble out of El Ray Johnson again. I have a hankering to see Arkansas. Bill drove in stony silence. Thatcher gazed out the window. El Ray gave up on engaging them and lapsed into a brooding silence. Although by now they were on the main highway, there was little to see. When they passed the plumber's place, Thatcher looked up toward the shack, but it was barely discernible against the black sky. The day he'd come upon Laurel wrestling with the wet sheet, the sky had been purely blue behind her. She'd made quite a sight, one engraved on his memory. He figured he would think back on it for the rest of his life. Under his breath, he cursed her. Damn it, Laurel, your pacing is making me dizzy. The whiskey is making you dizzy. Irv lifted the jar toward her. You should have a snort. Maybe it would calm you down. I can't afford to be calmed down. Since returning home and waking him up to report what she'd seen and hadn't seen, she'd been beside herself, unable even to sit. You don't know what it was like, looking down and seeing nothing there. Everything just gone. While she had been trying to grasp that her friends, the stills, the tent, everything had vanished, out of the corner of her eye, she'd caught headlight beams sweeping across the smooth face of a nearby hill. Not having had time even to fully regain her breath, she'd turned away from the abandoned site and had begun the return trip to the shack in a flat-out run. Most likely, 
Whoever was in those approaching vehicles would spend more time than she trying to figure out what had happened there and what the implications were. But that was a supposition, not something she could count on, and it was imperative that she not be caught in the vicinity, not by anyone. She'd also been frantic to share this news with Irv, who might possibly have some information unknown to her. Her most earnest hope was that he could provide an explanation for the site having been abandoned. But to her dismay, after she'd shaken him awake, he had listened to her breathless recitation of facts with astonishing and infuriating calmness. For the past hour, while she'd been whipping herself into a froth, he had grown increasingly mellow by sipping from a jar of moonshine. I'm sure Ernie's got it under control. She spun around to him. If you say that one more time, I'm going to hit you with something. You can't be sure of anything. They might have gotten away. They might even have gotten away with most of the equipment. But how far could they have gone carting all that? Ernie's old truck. Yes, Ernie's old truck. She stopped in her tracks and turned to face him, hands fisted at her sides. Why wasn't I ever told that Ernie had an old truck? Because we had no call to tell you. Until tonight, she shouted. If his truck is so well hidden in the hills, maybe they couldn't get to it. Carrying all that paraphernalia? How could they possibly? If the people in the three vehicles I saw launch a search... God! She resumed pacing and wringing her hands. Ernie and Corinne could be in custody, or worse, dead, and any minute now so could we be. I'm sure Ernie's got it. Her glare silenced him. He used the jar of moonshine to point at the article lying at the foot of his bed. I still think that could be a message of some sort. She picked up Corinne's workbook and slapped it against her palm. Of what sort? It's squiggles and lines. Then why'd you bother going in after it and bringing it back? You must have thought those hand scratches the girl made meant something. The return jaunt to the shack had seemed more hazardous because it was mostly downhill, and she'd run like the devil was chasing her, which she feared he was. By the time she'd reached the shack, her entire body had been about to give out on her. Muscles, lungs, heart had been taxed to their limit. She'd collapsed against her Model T, her arms outstretched across its hood, hugging it like a pilgrim at a shrine. She'd allowed herself one precious minute to slow her heartbeat and breathing. Partially restored, she'd willed herself to move and get into the Model T. I was backing into a turn so I could drive out when I remembered seeing this primer on the dresser. I honestly don't know what urged me to stop and get it. She opened the workbook to the page where Corinne had drawn what looked like absent-minded scribbles. She realized now that the printing of Ernie's name seemed beyond Corinne's present capabilities. Is Ernie literate? Yes. He's no scholar, but he can read good enough to get by. Then maybe this is his doing, and Corinne left the primer where she knew I would see it. Let me take another look. She rounded the bed where Irv was semi-reclined and handed him the primer. He studied this crudely drawn etching, tilting both his head and the workbook to various angles. Then a laugh began deep inside his chest before burbling out. What? What is it? He closed the primer and passed it back to her. Go to bed, Laurel. Not on your life. Turn out the light, everything's fine. I know where they're at. He refused to talk about it further, saying that morning would come soon enough. Frustrated but exhausted, Laurel turned out his bedroom light and pulled the door shut on her way out. Bone-weary as she was, she took a bath before retreating upstairs to her room, where she pulled on a fresh nightgown, took the pins from her hair, and gave it a good brushing. She plaited it loosely into her customary bedtime braid. She was about to extinguish the flame in the lamp when she saw his reflection in her dresser mirror. Gasping, she spun around, her hand at her throat. 43. Don't raise a ruckus. What do you think you're doing? Get out of here! Thatcher came into the room and quietly closed the door. 
If you don't leave in two seconds, I'll shoot you. With what? You keep your pistol in the pocket of your skirt. How do you know that? I've noticed you're always patting at it. Intending to mend and wash her tattered and soiled skirt in the morning, she'd left it on a hook on the back of the bathroom door, her pistol forgotten in the pocket. She didn't believe Thatcher meant to harm her, but she wished she had the Derringer to reinforce her point about his audacious intrusion. As you're well aware, Irv has a shotgun, she said. He's right downstairs. Sawing logs. I could hear his snores as I passed through the kitchen. If you don't leave now, I'll yell for him. No, you won't. You don't want me confronting him with this. This what? He didn't answer. Instead, he took off his well-worn black felt cowboy hat and set it on a table. Then he took off his jacket and folded it over the back of a chair. Pick those right back up, she said. I did not invite you to stay. In point of fact, I'm sick of you sneaking around me in my house. What gives you the right to do that, to show up at all hours of the night? When you always seem to be awake, awake and wound up like a top, I wonder why that is. If I'm wound up, it could be because you appear out of nowhere and catch me unfit to receive a visitor. Yes, this was twice, wasn't it, that he'd caught her wearing only... She didn't finish that thought, because, somewhat recovered from the shock of his being in her house, her bedroom, she realized that his demeanor was particularly solemn. His gray eyes shone in the lamplight beautifully, but reflecting bleakness. His face was drawn, his expression taut, emphasizing the sharp ridges of his cheekbones. He looked as though he were about to undertake a dreaded task, like someone designated to deliver tragic news. She felt twinges of alarm. Why was he here? It was then she noticed that his boots had been ghosted over with a fine, chalky dust, and she realized where he had been tonight before coming to her. Though her breathing turned quick and uneven, she struggled to keep her features schooled. She even managed to ask aloud the troubling question in her mind. Why are you here? He reached down to his coat and took something from the breast pocket, then walked over and set it on the dresser. Instantly recognizing a silver barrette, her heart seized up. She swallowed. I must have lost it in the yard. Speaking quietly, he said, I didn't find it in your yard, Laurel. She didn't need to ask where he had found it. She knew. But she brazened it out and made an offhanded gesture. Then it probably isn't mine. I've seen you wear it in your hair. Lots of women have that same clip. Hancock sells them, six to a card. You didn't need to bother to return it. Actually, I did. Why? Because I've got something to tell you. About a hair barrette? Have you seen Chester Landry around? The question was out of context. She replied with exasperation. No, I told you it was doubtful I would. Thatcher didn't look convinced. She added, I don't know the man. How many times do I have to tell you? Was the O'Connor's trip up to Ranger successful? He was intentionally trying to rattle her. She couldn't allow being caught off guard. Very. They didn't encounter any problems? In fact, they did. They sold out of pies in a matter of minutes and left some of the roughnecks disgruntled. I need to bump up production. If her flippant answer annoyed him, he didn't show it. How's Corinne working out? Involuntarily, she glanced at the barrette and could have kicked herself for doing so. She'll be able to do more when her arm gets stronger. She could tell by the way Thatcher was looking at her that he knew she was hedging every answer to these questions. On the surface, they might seem casual and random, but she knew they weren't. Do you know L. Ray Johnson? That query genuinely threw her. His name is vaguely familiar. Is he one of the... Notorious clan, yeah. His cousin Wally was murdered recently. L. Ray discovered his body. That's it. I remember reading his name in the newspaper. What about him? He told her about the teen's aborted attempt to steal a horse from Barker's stable. 
I took him to the jail and summoned the sheriff. That doesn't seem fair. You caught him before he stole anything. But I sensed that he had something else on his conscience. Turned out I was right. He confessed to stealing crates of corn liquor from a competing moonshiner. Those twinges of alarm became outright pangs. She was trembling on the inside, but managed to keep her voice steady. From what I understand, that happens routinely. This theft might have been routine if it had stopped at that, but it didn't. What happened? Last night, Elray and his cousin Tup went back to the same still. A decision they came to regret. There was an incident. Her heart in her throat, she asked, What kind of incident? One that warranted investigation. Tonight when Sheriff Amos organized a team of deputies to return to the scene with El Rey, I was more or less recruited to go along. That was the convoy she'd seen. Thatcher had been among those who'd discovered the location of their stills, and there he'd found the barrette she'd given Corinne. Feeling that her silence might be a giveaway to her mounting anxiety, she said, Like at Lefty's, you were roped into taking part in the raid. He gave a mirthless smile, literally, this time. He told her about lassoing El Rey, but that's neither here nor there. He was pressured into leading us to the site. Seemed like we covered miles of wilderness on roundabout roads. I thought the kid had been lying, but no, we found Cousin Tup. At the still? In a hole in the ground with his arm mangled so bad you couldn't identify it as a human part. His eyes holding steady on hers, he said, it had been snared in a bear trap. By now her heart was pumping so hard she thought she might faint. By a sheer act of will, she contained a sob pressing at the back of her throat. That's horrible, she said hoarsely. Was he dead? Last I heard, he was still alive, but short one arm. The strength to stand up deserted her. She sank down onto the end of her bed and hugged her elbows close to her body. How awful. Thatcher sat down in the rocking chair in which she had planned to spend hours rocking Pearl in her lap, reading to her from storybooks, loving her. She had attached a cushion to the chair's back, so she'd have something to lean her head against during nighttime feedings that had never taken place. Thatcher placed his head on that cushion now and closed his eyes. Whoever was operating the stills, there were at least two of them, had cleared out, taking everything with them. Setting that trap to catch a man stealing moonshine seemed extreme, a cruel thing to do. But, he continued on a sigh, Tup had stolen from them and had gone back with every intention of stealing again and then destroying their property. He and Elray had been ordered by the family head, Hiram, to rain down hell on them. If they hadn't caught Tup in that trap, if they hadn't cleared out, chances are good they would be dead. He rocked two or three arcs. I used to think the difference between right and wrong was clear-cut. Law and 